Hello, everybody. It is so good to be with you again. It's Pastor Matt here. And today we are finishing up our Fruit Box series. Uh, we've been going through the Fruit of the Spirit uh, for the last uh, quite a few weeks, and today is the last one. So let's go ahead and open up our Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Uh, verse 22 through 23. You know, you probably have these memorized by now because we've uh, read them every week, but let's just go ahead and go to it. Maybe this is the first time you've popped on or you haven't for a while. So let's go ahead and read Galatians chapter five. And here's what it says. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now, if we did a vote, uh, I think that the number one fruit that we would feel the need for the most help on, and then we feel the most consistent struggle in, is the fruit of self-control. When I talk with students, when I talk with adults, uh, when, I, when I talk with you about the things that are going on in your life, there is a consistency upon the topic of self-control that comes up. What is it about self-control? Um, I think it's because it encompasses every part of our life. Every decision that we make for the most part has self-control as part of the equation. Um, it's, a, it's a constant struggle. It, and I think it's also very visible to other people. And lacking self-control is kind of embarrassing sometimes, isn't it? Now, the image that comes to my mind when we're talking about lacking self-control is the character of Pigpen. Uh, you might remember Pigpen. He was Charlie Brown's friend. Uh, I remember from the Christmas special you've probably seen. Uh, Pigpen is that guy that would, he would go through life with this cloud uh, following him everywhere he went, right? It was a stink cloud because he didn't bathe or clean himself up, right? It was nasty. It was gross. Uh, wherever Pigpen went, this cloud just kind of loomed around him wherever he was. And that's what I kind of think about uh, self-control being like. It's just this stink cloud. It's it affects other people. It's around you. It, it, it hurts other people. It, it puts a strain on our relationships as well as affecting our relationship with God. Pigpen couldn't blame anybody else about this, this cloud of stink and dirt and dust and, and everything that was around him. And unfortunately, we can't blame other people for our lack of self-control either. Uh, there's, there's really nobody to blame but us. And so what does self-control mean? If we're going to be talking about it, what does it mean? Now, the word self-control uh, in the Bible, um, in, in, in the language, meant this, uh, kind of holding oneself in. The idea of, of inner strength. In some of your Bibles, Galatians 5 doesn't say self-control. In some translations, it says the word temperance. I know it's kind of an interesting word, but, but temperance is this idea of restraining passions or appetites. So self-control is this, this strength that comes from inside. It's this restraining of the passions or appetites that we might have in our life that, that aren't good. And if we're being honest with ourselves, which is always a good thing, self-control is a struggle, isn't it? Maybe not in every single situation. But I would, I would guess to say for, for many of us, self-control is, is a battle on, on too many areas of our life. We all need to develop and continually display self-control in our life. Self-control is, is even in the most basic things, right? Like watching too much TV or eating junk food or endless netbox, <laughs> netbox, endless Xbox or Netflix. Um, I kind of think of, of the movie Willy Wonka. Um, and do you remember Augustus Gloop, uh, the, the chocolate eating kid? He would just always eat chocolate all the time. And he falls into the river of chocolate because he just can't seem to have self-control. 
Now, we all need to have boundaries in our life, exercising self-control in things. But you know, most people, and I think even some of us that would say that we're followers of Christ, we live in a superficial level where we pretend and we kind of trick ourselves and others into thinking that we're in, we're in control of things. And when we live on the surface, instead of getting deep about the things that are going on in our life, uh, it's easy to kind of think that self-control isn't something that's, that's a big deal in our life. Maybe, maybe you've heard these kind of phrases. Oh, I can handle that. It's no big deal. If I really wanted to, I could stop. My issue isn't really that bad. It's only a little bit. It's not as bad as some of the other people that I know. That's really denial, isn't it? Denial keeps us on the surface instead of looking at the things that are deep inside of us. So if you can stop, why haven't you? And how bad does it have to be before you put in the effort to have self-control and stop? Paul. You might remember Paul. Paul in the Bible here talks about this struggle in Romans 7, 15. Look at, look at what it says here. He says, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Paul is like relating to us here. Haven't we been in that place where we know what we want to do and we want to honor God and yet we do the thing that we, that we know is wrong. We know that it's sinful. Paul here is, is one of like the most important people in the Bible that, that we have. He's a great example to us. Wrote so much of the New Testament. And here he's saying he's struggling with sin and self-control in his life. How many of us have a similar relationship with sin and self-control? I think all of us do. All of us are Paul at times. Probably more than we'd like and more than we'd admit it. It's so important for us to take Paul's example here and just admit it to ourselves and out in the open that, that we're just like him. In fact, we're like everybody else. We struggle with obeying God at times, don't we? We struggle with self-control. And we lose that battle. If we're honest with ourselves, then we can then kind of ask ourselves if we are wanting to do something about it. And I think it's important for us to do something about it because self-control defends against temptation and destruction. There's a negative side of lack of self-control. And look at what it says here. Self-control defends against temptation and destruction. Now, if I were going to ask you a question, this is a, a make-believe question. I'm not really offering this, but if I were to ask you, do you want me to kick you in the face or would you like me to give you $20? I think most of us would take the $20. Maybe a few of you might take the kick in the face. By the way, I'm not going to come kick you in the face and I'm also not going to give you $20, okay? But why would we say that? Why? A kick in the face hurts, and twenty dollars—that's useful. I can—that's beneficial to me. In the same thing, in the same way, having self-control is kind of like asking that question. Now, I'm not saying that self-control gets you access to like God's ATM because that's not really true at all. What I am saying is that life. That the life of somebody who is walking with God in self-control, that, li that life is filled with reward and blessing of pleasing God and walking with him. While a lack of self-control brings destruction to yourself and the relationships with others are broken and hurt and damaged. And it absolutely takes a relationship with God and it turns it into something so so much less than what God has ever intended it to be. Proverbs 25, 28 says this, a person without self-control is as defenseless 
as a city with broken down walls. In the Old Testament language here, walls is walls of protection. You, you want to protect something, what do you want to protect? You want to protect something of value. You want to protect something that is important. And what has value? Your life has value. Hear me say that, that your life has value. And if your life has value, you want to build up walls that protect it. You want to fortify it like you would a city. Because when the walls come down in a city and the, and the walls come down in your life, we are susceptible to the attacks of the enemy, the temptation of the world, and our own sinful desires that are opposite of what God would want for us in our life. A life without self-control really does bring destruction. Thankfully, a life with self-control leads to godliness and love. Self-control leads to godliness and love. Let's look at 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7. If you need a second, hit the pause button, but we're going to keep going here. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7. Here's what it says. It says, your faith will produce a life of moral excellence. Now, if you're I'm going to stop here real quick. If, if you have your Bible with you, you're taking notes, I want you to underline or highlight these key words that I'm going to give you. So let's just start again here. Your faith, underline faith, will produce a life of moral excellence. Moral excellence, underline that. A life of moral excellence leads to knowing God better. Underline that phrase, knowing God better. And knowing God leads to, there it is, self-control. Underline self-control. Self-control leads to patient endurance. Underline patient endurance. Patient endurance leads to godliness. Underline godliness. Godliness leads to love, underline love, for other Christians. Until finally, you will grow to have genuine love for everyone. Underline genuine love for everyone. Notice that progression. Faith, the faith that you have when you respond to the gospel and God puts that faith in you, the faith that you have to trust him with your life, it leads to living a life that's different, which leads to knowing God better. You want to know him and, and that knowledge of him and who he is and his character and his love for you leads to having self-control in your life. And self-control then continually leads towards godliness and love, not just for those that are your friends or those that are in your church but genuine love for the world, genuine love for the lost, genuine love for, for anybody because God loves them so much. Notice that progression. And self-control is a key part of that progression. Self-control is the practical kind of drawing the line in the sand and living it out through your actions and words and thoughts that Jesus is better than anything that the world has to offer. That nothing is better. Self-control says that Jesus matters more than the things that you want. Sometimes we want things so bad, but it's opposite of what God wants. It says that your faith is leading you towards living a life that is pleasing to him, that is putting your desires aside and saying, Jesus, what do you want for my life? And as you take those steps of exercising your self-control and saying no to sin and yes to Jesus, it leads to a life that is moving away from the world's way towards God's way. The Bible says that we are to love God with our, all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we're to love our neighbor as ourself. Both of these together, what Jesus says are the greatest commandments, the greatest callings on our life to love God and to love others. And self-control is part of that mechanism in our life that says, Jesus, I love you with everything, and I'm going to, to trust you. I'm going to live for you. I'm going to love you. And my desire is to please you in everything that I do. So I'm going to have self-control in my life so that way I can show this love to you. Self-control is demonstrated how I treat others. Am I 
going to help this person instead of just being lazy and not, not helping out? When I see a need, am I going to help with that need? Or am I going to turn a blind eye to it? He says, I'm not going to argue with people or treat others with anger or hate or to get revenge or get even with them. It's going to be I'm respectful and I'm going to treat others in a way that demonstrates that God loves them. Self-control in my life is a blessing to other people. And, and so thankful I am that God has demonstrated self-control to us so that we have an example of that. The Bible says that he is patient towards sinners, towards us, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance, that all would be able to hear and respond to the gospel. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, that he was patient even in our sinfulness and that he still loved us enough. He didn't, he didn't wait for us to get our act together and, and to be good. He knew that we needed Jesus to die on the cross. He knew that we needed to accept Jesus Christ as our savior and to repent of our sins. He knew that we needed that. And so out of amazing demonstration of self-control, God has, has drawn us to him. I mean, thankfully, Jesus, when he was on his way to the cross, on the cross, he, he could have just said, you know what, time out, stop, I'm out. I, I don't want to do this anymore. And he could have just ended the whole thing. He demonstrated self-control so that way we can have a relationship with God, so we can be restored to him and live a life that's pleasing to God. He wanted to demonstrate what it meant to please God, even in a very tough and difficult circumstance of dying, that he demonstrated self-control. Our self-control can, in fact, be a demonstration of the gospel and a picture of a changed life that Jesus has saved you and given you purpose for something even greater than yourself, greater, greater than my selfish desires or the, the things that I may want to do that the world would say would be best, that I can have self-control. So how do we take steps towards a self-controlled life? How, how do we take steps so that way we can act and live in self-control to God's honor and glory? Well, I think the first one would be to say that we need to be changed by God's word. We need God to change us from the inside out. We need to to have him and his word be living and active in us. It is such a huge tool for us and to help us in self-control to know what God expects, know what God desires for us, know who God is, know his character, know how much he loves us. Because man, when we know that and understand that even more, it helps us to make those real-time decisions of self-control in our life. Ephesians 4 talks about how we need to set our minds on things above, not on the things of the earth. Man, the things that, that are of the earth, they require us to have self-control. When we are focused on God and his great love for us, it, and, and we find that through his word, it fuels us to have self-control. Two, pray for the Holy Spirit's help. Right? All of these through the Spirit are, are, are given to us through the Holy Spirit, right? So we need to ask the Holy Spirit for help. We can't do this on our own. We need His help. God has given us His amazing power through the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and courage and power to have self-control in any situation. Not just the easy ones or the ones that we want to have self-control, but even the ones that are so difficult and hard that we feel like we can't do it. Holy Spirit is absolutely there to help us. We need his help. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. That's what Romans 8, 26 says. He wants to help you. Press into the Holy Spirit and allow him to help you. Three, we need to confess our sins to God. 1 John 1, 7 says, The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We're going to sin. We're, there's going to be times where we don't have self-control and we mess up. Thankfully, we can go to God and ask him for forgiveness. 
And I would say when you, when you do lose self-control, be quick to go to God and, and ask him for that forgiveness. Don't let it linger. Don't let your heart get hard. Keep a soft heart and wanting to go back to him and repent and ask him, say, God, I know I messed up. Will you please forgive me? Number four, gather godly friends to help. We have God's word. We have his spirit. But God has also given us fellow followers of Christ to lean on and press into and have relationship with so that, in part, we can have self-control in our life. Sometimes asking people for help is really hard, isn't it? Our pride gets in the way. We're worried about what other people might think about us. Oh man, I can't believe that they're dealing with that. The truth is, a lot of times we're all dealing with the same stuff. But the truth is also that we need godly people in our lives pointing us to Jesus, his word, giving us wise counsel, cheering us on. We need other people. We need godly friends to walk with us. Proverbs 12.15 says, fools think that they need no advice, but the wise listen to others. Don't be a fool. Don't think that you can resist temptation and the pull of the world all by yourself. We need other people. Go to them. Go to the people. Maybe in your life group, that's a great place for this to start out. Your leaders care for you so much. They want to help you. Have a friend in your life group who loves Jesus. If maybe you're like, man, I don't know who those people are, be praying that God would bring those people into your life. If there's something that's going on in your life, I would love to help you. Our team would love to help you. Please reach out to us. We would love to be part of that process of helping you have self-control in your life and honor God. Number five, identify and remove your triggers. What are the things that are in your life that tempt you and, and, and lead you to losing self-control? What are those things? Can you remove those things? Some of those things you can, right? If it's, man, I'm wasting all my time on my phone or my Xbox or watching TV. Well, maybe, maybe you kind of need to remove some of those things for a time being. Could be a lot of things, but what are those things that are leading you down paths that God doesn't want for you. Identify the ways that you lose self-control. And if you get rid of it, that might mean making a really hard choice, but that's okay. That's okay. And step number six, remember the gospel when you fail. Hebrews 4 says this, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Thankfully, God gives us mercy and grace when we go to him humbly. We're going to fail. We absolutely are. There's going to be times where we, we don't have self-control, where we sin, where we mess up. And thankfully, we have a loving God who is waiting with his arms open to say, come here. I want to give you grace and mercy. So keep a soft heart and come to him often. And remember that God loves you so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for your sins, that he gave his one and only son. So that way you could have a restored relationship with the God of the universe. To kind of wrap up today, when we exercise self-control, we pursue a holy life that is glorifying to God. And isn't that what we want to do as Christ followers? We want to glorify God with our life. Self-control is such an important part of that process. Self-control helps us to live an honoring life to him. So I just want to pray for you and encourage you to walk in self-control and all of these fruits of the spirit. God, I just pray for the students that, or anybody that's hearing this, God, that you would help us to have self-control in our life like we've talked about today. That our lives would be a reflection of the grace that we have received from you through Jesus Christ. God, we love you. Help us to glorify you with our lives. In your name, amen.